What's happening, folks? Geologist Philip Prince. I uh, want to talk about the Myanmar earthquake. More and more news is coming out about this event, uh, given where it happened, which in the big picture is right about there. As we're going to see in a moment up close, it was basically right underneath the, the city of Mandalay. A uh, big city like that, construction practices that are probably not uh, designed to address big earthquake shocks, that many people, you're going to see a, an absolutely astronomical death toll. Um, news of that, I think, is starting to take shape, and you're going to hear more and more about it. I um, want to talk about why there are big earthquakes in this part of the world, uh, how they're connected to the Himalayas up here. Uh, this entire part of, of East Asia is one of, if not the most tectonically dynamic areas in the entire world. And you can always expect to see news of seismic activity here. Uh, obviously, the big events tend to space out over time. They tend to space out geographically. But suffice it to say, it's it's no surprise when you get a big earthquake in this part of the world. Uh, as we start moving closer and closer here, we'll, uh, we'll mark where the earthquake happened again. Uh, going to be Something like right in, in this area, and that's the uh, the main shock, the magnitude 7.7 .7 main shock. Uh, if you just take a look at this Google Earth image looking looking straight down, something that uh, that pretty quickly jumps out here is the fact that there's a pretty straight line cutting through the landscape. If you see something like that uh, just about anywhere on Earth's surface, it's it's fault related. Now, that fault is not necessarily active. In this case, of course, it's very active. But if you if you see a landform like that, that that's basically a straight line uh, extending for hundreds of miles uh, across the landscape, you can have a pretty good idea that it is a fault and there's going to be earthquake hazard in, in that part of the world. And as you zoom in closer and closer here, we're going to tilt the view and look up towards the north. And that gives you a really good sense of how that fault line is expressed along the ground surface. Uh, another way to tell what's going on there is the fact that the uh, the Irrawaddy River sort of follows that line before, before stepping out of it there. Uh, the city of Mandalay, which you'll be hearing more and more about, get a decent color here, uh, that's located right there. And again, the main shock of the earthquake was uh, something like approximately what we're what we're drawing on there, uh, just a little bit northwest of the city. And this is a very densely populated city. Um, don't hear a lot again about what what goes on in Myanmar for political reasons, but Google Earth, uh, of course, provides you a way to actually take a look at at what this place looks like. And if you zoom in closer and closer to this city, which is certainly the closest big center of population to, to where the earthquake happened, it's extremely, extremely densely populated. Uh, and one would imagine that uh, a lot of this architecture uh, wasn't, wasn't considering earthquakes when it was done. Uh, densely populated, rapidly growing places like this, uh, they tend to build sort of by necessity. And, you know, that that doesn't really take into account the overall seismic hazard. I actually don't know what the uh, what the population of Mandalay is. And of course, it would probably just be just be an estimate. But it's a good sized place goes and goes. Uh, and it's actually quite close. To the big river here, uh, the Irrawaddy River down in the valley. That would mean that there's probably a fair amount of, of sediment that's accumulated uh, in, in a big flat river valley like this. Don't know that for sure, but if there is adequate accumulation of basically saturated sediment, that sets the stage for, uh, for liquefaction as uh, a consequence of the earthquake. You get the shaking going on, it basically liquefies the soil, and that promotes uh, building collapse. So again, I don't know if that's um, if that's been an issue here. But certainly the appearance of the landscape in a, a river valley of this scale, that's something that would uh, that would be considered. So thinking in the big picture, uh, why why is there a huge fault line here? Uh, this is is very similar, actually, to the to the San Andreas fault uh, in in California, sort of a long, straight, linear feature. And the motion sense here is is 
side to side. We're not, you know, squeezing and pushing something up here. Uh, why is why is this present in this part of the world? Uh, very tectonically active, but when you think about this region, of course, you're going to be thinking about these big snow-capped mountains of the, the Himalaya out there in the distance. It's a very distinct looking part of the world in in terms of the landscape and the mountain ranges it's kind of this funny uh i don't know you could come up with a variety of words to describe it there's sort of a, a almost like a like a big cove if you will or, or an embayment there into the edge of the mountains got a lot of very interesting wrinkles and folds in the earth's crust here uh and those are sort of spaced out a little bit from the uh from the fault line that we're we're talking about here so i wanted to to try to give just a basic overview of what exactly is going on in this part of the world that would cause you to have a big earthquake like this uh, that's actually very much away from the, the big Himalaya mountains. Uh, there is a very large earthquake several years back, uh, basically right at the foot of the Himalayas, uh, actually changed the elevation of Mount Everest a little bit, all part of the same moving tectonic system and fundamentally, what you want to think about here is the Indian plate moving kind of like that and crashing into Eurasia. So you get uh, a relative kind of compressing movement, but the Indian plate has, you know, it has, it has edges on it. And that's where some of the complexity comes in, but you can, uh, you can sketch this out pretty well and just give a basic idea of why on the eastern side here there's relative movement like you see there that's producing big earthquakes but a totally different type of earthquake than you might see uh in a place like this right at the at the foot of the himalaya like Kathmandu, for example so we'll uh we'll sketch this out in uh in paint real quick hopefully give you a good idea of why this particular fault system moves like it does so hang on just a minute Okay, so what's up with uh, with plate tectonics in, in this part of the world? You hear a lot about the Himalaya. You don't hear nearly as much about what's going on over on the Burma side. Uh, but fortunately, we can put together a pretty simple sketch here that's going to show you just about everything that you need to know to understand why there was a really big earthquake in Myanmar uh, and why the Earth's plates were moving like they did in this part of the world. Uh, so there's going to be our Eurasian plate. And down here, we're going to have an Indian plate that's going to crash into it. Basic sense of motion here is going to be they're going to hit each other. Pretty simple. What's going to happen when they hit each other? Uh, well, where they hit head on, think of two cars hitting head on. You're going to kind of rumple and fold and stack the rocks of Earth's crust. The Indian plate has an edge on it, though, so there's not going to be a head-on collision everywhere, and that's going to be a really important part of, of how this system works. So, What's this, uh, what's this area going to look like after this collision has been going on for tens of millions of years uh, and has sort of taken the shape of what we see today? Well, first and foremost, you're going to need that rumpled and crumpled and folded part of the Eurasian plate there. We'll go ahead and get rid of that old outline behind it. And now, got to keep, keep changing our outlines to try to capture the overall geologic change that has happened here. So there's going to be my sort of embayment there into the Eurasian plate. I'll tell you what, we'll uh, reshape that here just a little bit. Bring that down, something like that. I think that's going to, I think that's going to work better. Okay, very good. And actually, we don't even need to put that line there. More on that momentarily. So we'll get rid now of just about all of our old outlines here but not all of them and it's that that not all of it that's going to be uh it's going to be kind of the key point so get that all taken care of there indian plate still exists but it's going to be sort of sticking out from under the eurasian plate that it's been pushed up under and then put the boundary looking kind of like that Should work out pretty well. Let's give ourselves a little bit of mountain topography here. Uh, of course, none of this is going to be to scale, but we're just trying to give you a sense of where this really rough mountain topography is located. A lot of times, like a drawing like this, kind of exaggerate and stylize things just a little bit. But 
what we're trying to show is that due to this collision, sort of like that that car collision analogy, ended up rumpling and, and stacking the Earth's crust on top of itself. And that's produced big mountain topography in places where you've got that, that head-on collision going on. Now, there's still mountain topography developing along the edges. It's just not quite as dramatic. And really what you're looking at here, uh, sort of interesting, you can produce it uh, with physical models, actually, and, and end up with something that actually looks quite a bit like the real world here. What's going on where the, the corner of India is kind of punched in up there at the top right? Uh, it's almost like the mountains are sort of wrapping around where that where that punch has taken place there. Now, I mentioned that not all of the diagram had to change, and well... There's part of it right here on the right that didn't move at all. That's going to be sort of the, the fixed part of the diagram. Everything else is moving relative to that. And that's going to be the setting for, for our, big, uh, our big earthquake right there. So what's going on? Basically, the, the simplest explanation is that with the big collision there between the Indian plate uh, and Eurasia. It's almost like part of it here on the eastern edge is, is kind of being dragged along just a little bit, and it's broken free from what we're drawing here as, as the fixed part on the, uh, on the eastern side there. And the result of that relative movement is going to be plate movement like that. So you got Got a shift sort of like that, and that produces the uh, the strike slip earthquake like we saw in uh, in Myanmar. You can have big earthquakes over here as well, like we did near Kathmandu several years ago. Earthquake here on this side. They're both big, but the movements are the movements are entirely different. The one on the left there, going to have squeezing and and upward movement of the overriding plate. Uh, and again, on the right there, you're going to have this, you're going to have this strike slip style of motion. So two different, two different edges of the tectonic plates, all part of the same movement system, but due to where you are on the edges of the plates, the, the style of movement is different. Uh, over here on the, on the Eastern side of the strike slip side, the earthquake was, was pretty shallow. It was about 10 kilometers, six miles below the surface. That's a shallow depth. Um, being in that river valley with a big, densely populated city over top of a shallow earthquake like there, uh, like that, it's it's about as bad as uh, about as bad as it's going to get. So, simple diagram, but one that hopefully captures uh, just the the nature of the movement. And when you think about geology worldwide, particularly from the plate tectonic standpoint, if you're thinking about earthquakes. Move, movement is key because that's what an earthquake is. It's a tiny little bit of slip along a fault. Now, the amount of movement that we've shown here in this drawing requires millions and millions and millions and millions of years to accumulate. That being said, that is the result of just these little little lurches over time whose overall effects produce this, this kind of change uh, in the Earth's crust. So, Keep this picture in mind. Uh, we'll take it back to uh, take it back to Google Earth now and see if you can recognize this this overall setup in the actual landscape. So hang on just a minute. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we're what we're trying to sketch there in in real life. Uh, we'll use bright red here. I don't know that may be kind of a red green issue for some viewers, but there's that red fault line that I drew. Another color is going to look better. We'll take it back to uh, we'll take it back to white here. So there's that fault line with movement like that. There's the big front of the Himalaya, and there's the embayment coming around. Overall movement here, and we'll be sure to take it far enough. Something like that, and it's just dragging, uh, kind of dragging that edge of the eastern eastern continental area along with it. That's setting you up to have that really big, uh, that really big earthquake there, and because it is, it's moving like that, it's going to send 
energy out sort of down along the fault line, uh, actually down towards, among other places, Bangkok, which is just just actually behind my uh, behind my face window right here, I think. A um, lot of damage there. Uh, I'm not sure what the uh, what the human toll has been in Bangkok. It's quite a distance away, but given its underlying geology, the nature of the movement here and how that energy propagates, even though it's not right on the fault, even though it's not in the same country, it can still experience really dramatic shaking and very, uh, very severe damage from an event like this. So you could, uh, you could absolutely make comparisons to the San Andreas fault in, in California with, with this system, just given the way things are moving, uh, actually even the, the sense of the sense of movement, um, the San Andreas is, is what we call a dextral fault. If you look at it in front of you, the top of it would be moving to the right. Exactly what we got going on here. Uh, and around it, there's there's also that collisional movement with plates going going under each other. So there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of commonality there between the two, uh, at least in terms of movement. But there will be continued aftershocks here. You'll hear more and more about this uh, in in coming days. Given the fact that there is a huge city literally right next to uh, right next to where this happened. Uh, you can see the city there, and you can see that fault line right next to it. This this is quite this is quite bad. And will we ever know just how bad it was, given the the nature of the political scene in in Myanmar and its relationship to the outside world? I actually don't know that. But suffice it to say, this is this is one of the bigger earthquake disasters that has has probably happened in in recent years. And we'll just have to uh, have to see how this continues to unfold in coming days. I uh, hope you found this video interesting. Uh, a lot of the maps that you see online tend to show you where it is. They'll even show you where that where that big fault line is there. But there's not a lot of discussion necessarily uh, about why the Earth's crust is moving like that in this particular location uh, and what it has to do with the Himalayas nearby because it's all part of that same kind of moving moving system there. So hopefully this was uh, was illustrative to you about, about what's going on there, and we'll just have to see what happens uh, in coming days as this story continues to unfold.